Hi, this is just a very quick introduction to how I make my peg soldiers. It's been requested quite a lot, so I thought I'd better get around to doing one. This is going to be a really rough guide into how I do my soldiers, but I thought it was better to get something just out there. Um, I'm probably going to be making a more comprehensive tutorial later where I go into my crafting of peg soldiers in more detail. So let's begin at the beginning and talk a little bit about pegs. The sort of clothes pegs I've been using to make my model soldiers are the long thin pin type. In fact, I think they're more correctly called clothes pins and not clothes pegs. These have a head, shoulder, body and leg elements to the peg, which is handy and obviously the reason that at some point they inspired someone to make the first peg dolls. The pins I generally use are made from beech wood and come in packs of 24 and usually cost about £2 a bag or even less. There's a little bit of variety in the design between pin brands. Nothing dramatic, just some slight deviation in the shape of, say, the head or the shoulder element of the peg. As usual, when a pastime becomes even slightly popular, some enterprising individual comes up with a way of commercialising the hobby, and peg doll making has been no exception. There are now a number of wooden peg blanks out there specifically for crafting little wooden figures. These come in a multitude of shapes and sizes, some quite large, though obviously these are probably a little impractical for making toy soldiers. But they are an option for the ambitious among you. I like to stick with regular sized pegs. In fact, I prefer to trim mine down to about half size, which is about 50 millimeters. As with any new hobby, the best place for you to start is by looking at what other people are doing before you even think of putting brush to peg. A quick trawl through Google will soon give you some ideas and inspiration, and the first thing you'll probably notice is what a diverse and individual craft peg soldier making is. Practically everyone who makes peg figures does so in a slightly different way. And this is lesson number one. There are no rules. The way you make your peg soldier is absolutely up to you. What I would suggest is you start with some pens and paper and simply doodle some of your ideas about what you think a peg soldier should look like. This is the first step in developing your own style. Things to consider at this stage are not only the decoration of the figure, but how it's physically constructed. My figures are quite minimalistic. I add most of my physical attributes, like arms, hands, features, by painting them on, and generally not by adding additional pieces of wood or other materials to represent these features. This is why your prototypes are so important. Part of your style is how you choose to model the additional attributes and accessories. OK, let's go on with an actual example of making a peg soldier. Even though my soldiers are cut down pegs, the general concepts for construction are applicable to whatever size you decide to do your figure, whether your model is a full peg or a mini peg soldier. The first stage is the preparation of the peg. If, for example, you're adding a hat or a helmet, you may want to cut off a small slice of the top of your peg so that the hat sits neatly on top of your soldier's head. Next, you may want to add additional accessories or applied features. Add my rifles or any packs at this stage. And you might also want to add a base for stability. I use standard circular 20mm MDF miniature bases. I tend to pin and glue on my accessories to help prevent the items from breaking off easily. The model complete, I add a coat of primer. I work using acrylic paints, but this works equally well with enamels of course. One word of caution though, if you intend your models to be used by young children as toys, please ensure that you use child-friendly non-toxic paints and varnishes. An advantage of priming, using white or grey paint, is that you can now draw onto your peg guidelines for your model's features. Of course, if you have added supplementary accessories or parts for arms, belts, collars, webbing, etc., then these act as good guides for your painting anyway. I prefer to work freehand though. When painting, I follow the usual inner outer technique for laying down my paint areas. In other words, I work from the lowest feature, like the skin, outwards to the topmost, like belts and decorations. A byproduct of this technique is it helps you neaten up your painting as you can paint over your lower coats as you go along. Finally, I add any fiddly details including the outlining of any features I think the figure needs, usually to add a sense of three-dimensional depth. Now naturally, if you've added these details as additional accessories, this may not be necessary. Detail can be painted on using a fine brush if you have a steady hand. 
or you can use pens to draw any fine lines. But a word of warning, be sure to test any pens you want to use on a test piece of material first. Even so-called permanent marker pens can run when used in conjunction with incompatible paints or varnishes. Test all your paint materials first to ensure they play together well or prepare to face the consequences. In this particular case, I had to repaint my figure. I found that the Posca brand of acrylic markers works well with other acrylic medium, but never take anything for granted. I repeat, test all medium before painting. And finally, you'll want to add a coat of varnish to your model, particularly if it's intended as a gaming piece. I like to gloss varnish my pieces because I like the traditional toy soldier look, but you might prefer a matte or a satin varnish. But do remember to test these varnishes in combination with your paints for compatibility. And that's about it. That's really all there is to making a single peg soldier. However, multiple figures, mounted figures, and whole armies of peg figures add many, many complications, and I may cover them at a later date. Good luck.